So I'm going to talk about pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. Um, these slides um, were provided by a colleague of mine in Ottawa. She was supposed to give the talk, was unable to give the talk. Um, so I'll give kudos to uh, Dr. Rachel Goodwin, who's an excellent speaker and excellent slides. So I'm going to talk about the pancreas a little bit, about pancreas exocrine insufficiency, and I will call that PEI. And for those of uh, you that know the area we live in, uh, I live in Nova Scotia, which is a province of Canada, and the province right next to us is Prince Edward Island, also known as PEI, known for some of the best beaches in the world. And uh, actually there's two beaches there in the top 10 in the world there. So, so we all like love PEI, but not pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk about how you make the diagnosis, what it is, um, and then what non-pharmacological adjuvant um, adjunctive treatment you do, and then talk a little bit about uh, HERT or pancreatic uh, enzyme replacement therapy. And there's a couple of different drugs out there. Um, these slides were created uh, in conjunction with one company, but it lists all the company or the, all the different slides there. And so I don't believe there's any bias. I've gone through the slides to make sure there's no bias. And then addressing inadequate treatment response. What do we do for that? For the people that don't seem to respond to this as well. Some of the objectives are to understand the etiology. And this is more directed towards family doctors or, or, or physicians, but identify patients in your practice with unresolved uh, GI complications. Uh, learn how to diagnose them and how to initiate therapy to provide clinical benefit. So a little bit with physiology. So pancreas is an is a organ that's found deep inside our stomach. It's our, deep inside our abdomen, uh, sitting sort of just below the stomach. Uh, and it uh, has a distinctive, has two distinctive uh, uh, functions that it does. One is what we call endocrine function and one is called exocrine. And so the endocrine function everyone hears about someone who has diabetes and they don't make enough insulin. And that's because the pancreas produces that hormone. There's a number of other hormones made by the pancreas, but the major one is, is insulin. And they're made from the islets, of the, the cells that make them are they're called the islets of Lagerhand. But the major part of what the pancreas does is not making insulin. The major part of what about 95% of the cells are an exocrine. And that means it secretes enzymes and specifically digestive enzymes. It often secretes uh, uh, these enzymes and is triggered both by other um, hormones in your bodies that tell you to, to, to release these, as well as the nervous system will, will react and cause these thinner cells to produce certain enzymes that are released. And they're released out through the pancreatic duct into the, into the uh, section of the small bowel. And you see a picture up there in the top right. You can see that, that they've cut away part of the, uh, of the small intestine. You can see that little hole. That's where the pancreatic duct comes out and the, and the gallbladder and the bile duct join together with that and they produce those enzymes. And that's released just after the stomach. It also produces a lot of bicarb and the bicarbonate will neutralize some of the acid in the stomach to allow those enzymes to work. So it releases enzymes and specific different enzymes that help you digest carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. And then it releases the bicarbs, which neutralize the acidic chyme is the, is the term we use for, for after you've eaten food and it's churned around the stomach and digested and it's had the stomach acid, we call that chyme. And it's you, this, this, um, the, the, these enzymes are released and, and they work best at a certain uh, acidic level or pH level. And so the enzymes are, or the bicarbonate brings the, the pH uh, to, a, to a level that will work better for these enzymes. And the pancreas does, uh, does have um, nerves that control it as well as the secretion. So if you, even if the, you take the nerves off the pancreas, just the, the fact that the certain food comes into the, 
into the duodenum, there's actually some, which is the first part of the bowel after the stomach, uh, certain of those uh, cells will automatically release certain enzymes that will start breaking down tryptin, which is the major enzyme that react, causes a lot of the other enzymes to be reacted. So it has both, both stimulated by local hormones and by the uh, nerves. What happens so when you eat something, you eat something at time zero, you see, and then immediately within the first half hour, you'll release those enzymes. They don't come out right away, but they're about a half hour, which gives you time for your stomach to work. Your stomach will digest the foods and start the acid will start to break it down a little bit and it'll uh, mix it up. And then it goes past the stomach into the duodenum and these enzymes come out and they're in response to a regular meal and they come up over about 30 minutes, they hit their peak, and then they decrease over about three or four hours and then they'll stop altogether. If you eat again, another meal 30, they'll come again. And so, so they react a lot to both eating food and, and, uh, and, the, uh, and the nerves that tell you that your stomach is starting to work. <clears throat> so what is PEI or what is pancreatic exocrine insufficiency? It's when your pancreas is not making enough enzymes. So it's defined as inadequate activity of the pancreatic enzymes within the lumen of the small intestine. So you may have good, you know, adequate enzymes, but they are just aren't getting out. Or, or it could be, you know, that they're, they're, they're getting out, but they aren't, they aren't, there's not enough there. So we'll talk about that. It's, it refers to when it doesn't get to the lumen of the small intestine. And what happens is you have impaired digestive function and decrease nutrient mal or nutrients that you can absorb. So anything that impairs how you digest that food. So it could be a primary problem. It could be defects in the pancreas itself. It could be that you don't have a pancreas. You've had that removed. It could be your pancreas has been, has been damaged because of pancreatitis, which is a, uh, there's a number of different causes of pancreatitis. Um, people with cystic fibrosis, their pancreas doesn't work very well. And so that could be a defect in how it works or, or you know, tropical pancreatitis or inherited disorders of the pancreas. The secondary causes could be the failure to secrete the enzyme. So for whatever reason that the pancreas isn't putting it out or that there's some type of damage. So let's say there, there was a cancer of the pancreas that was blocking the duct. And so that you may, because it's blocking the duct, you, the obvious thing that most people will see is they become jaundiced because that's the duct that also comes from your liver. But it also could be that you stop digesting foods as well. And so that your, your first signs of getting pancreatic cancer may be PEI that you're seeing, you're feeling more bloated, you're having more symptoms. I'll get into the symptoms in a second, but you may find that as the first signs that you might have something wrong with your pancreatic duct. Or it could be that for some reason, those enzymes in the small bowel are being secreted, but they aren't, they aren't uh, being uh, activated or they aren't working properly. So that's another reason that you could have a secondary uh, PEI. So what happens? So you have this insufficiency and what happens is you don't digest your food as well. And so undigested food will go through your GI tract. And that could be one of the signs. It doesn't necessarily have to have malabsorption. It's just that the food is just not getting broken down enough. And even though the enzymes are all there, they haven't been broken down enough so you can absorb that. And so it could be maldigestion or malabsorption. Um, and what, what does that look like clinically to a person? Well, uh, it, the first thing that most people comment is their stools are a lot looser than normal. Um, they, they're, the, the, it's, it's not been all broken down. So you might have food particles in it. You might have a lot more fat in it. You may, because the food is not being uh, digested as well, it sits in your stomach and you have a lot of abdominal pain with that. Despite you eating lots, you're producing more stool and you're losing weight. And the weight is, uh, and, and the, the last one is what we call steatorrhea, which means that there's a lot of fat 
in the stool. And so the stool normally, you know, um, you, you, you would have it. And if it has a lot of fat in it, you'll see that uh, when you ha have a bowel movement, then on top of the toilet, there's like a, 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 a film of oil on there. You might see that. And your, 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 your family knows as well, because when you have steatorrhea, the, you know, not the stool, any stool smells well, but you smell it a lot more. That relate with, with getting that, you can get some uh, vitamin deficiency. So a number of the uh, uh, vitamins can be deficient because the food's going through and there's not enough time for it to get absorbed and, it, and it's not broken down so that they can get that. And as well as just vitamins, it could be just all, all nutrition. You won't absorb food as well. That can cause other problems. If you aren't, aren't getting food, well, not only are you gonna feel tired, you may have, uh, but you also can affect different functions. Like for example, your bones, your, uh, because you're not absorbing calcium as much, your bones may be deficient in that and you have uh, decreased bone mineral density. Um, it can have increased risk with malabsorption. You'll have increased risk of um, cardiovascular events or thrombosis. Uh, and this can all lead to people that are malabsorbed have increased uh, mortality or specifically deaths that they can, they can die more often if they aren't absorbing food and they're malnourished. Dr. Colwell, can I interrupt and ask sure. a couple of questions on behalf yeah. of our participants? <laughs> okay, um, so Patricia is asking if exocrine insufficiency can um, begin or occur a long time after a Whipple surgery has been done or after another type of treatment? So, so Whipple's operation, in, and I'll show this later on, but in a pain, with, when you have a Whipple's operation that you can have anywhere from like 40 to 100% of people with Whipple's operation will get malabsorption. You may not notice it right away. You may not have all those symptoms right away and you can have, and I'll talk about that later on, that, it could be just that you're, you're having it and it takes a while before you actually notice those different symptoms come up. Okay, thank you. And then Heidi was saying that her mom was pre prescribed Zenpap with every meal, but she doesn't eat. She has lost so much weight. Um, Heidi's encouraging her mom to try and take it with her boost nutritional drinks, but she states that she always feels full and she's wondering if that's always common with pancreatic cancer. So did you say she was taking Zantac? Zenpac. Zenpac, which I'm not sure which one that, that is a brand name. So I'm not, that could be the enzymes, but it may be that she'll need that. The problem is that the reason that you lose weight could be multifactorial. It could be all because of the pancreatic insufficiency and you might need to increase your enzymes that you're taking. But it also could be that the cancer itself makes you so you don't feel hungry. It uses more energy and you lose weight just because of cancer. So let's go here. So what are the clinical, oh, what are the clinical and physiological diagnosis? So clinical symptoms, I'm gonna go through that. I'm gonna go through the differential diagnosis, a little bit of, um, high prevalence populations. And I'll talk a little bit, like we said, cystic fibrosis and different diseases when you see this, the evidence of it and what we do in terms of getting a therapeutic trial. And my slides aren't turning. So one of the most, you know, what you find for most of these patients is they get a lot of abdominal pain. So as you mentioned that, that, that question, this is a very common symptom of abdominal pain, but it's not specific. Abdominal pain can occur in a lot of different things. So you have to sort of take the whole history, what's going on, all that. They may have a lot more gas. So flatulence you know, can occur a lot more because they aren't absorbing the food and you have a lot of fat that, that isn't broken down. So you get a lot more gas. It may be that they'll have weight loss. The loss, um, now, there's other things that cause all these things, so you have to sort of take these into account. Um, if they're children and they have pancreatic insufficiency, and this is often with someone with cystic fibrosis, for example, they aren't gaining weight. So, so the, the child is failure to thrive. 
and, and you might want to think about, you know, cystic fibrosis with that. The stools are a lot looser. And then there's that fat, that's the artery or the fat on top of the stools. So those are very, and these are all symptoms that you look for, but they could be related to other diseases. You know, it could be, um, and, th and then you look at what, what comes out from that. You know, is it just maldigestion, malabsorption? Uh, those are some of the things, and steatorrhea. And it's about, you know, that doesn't occur until about 90% of the pancreatic function is lost. So as I said, they're foul smelling, greasy. The stools tend to float on top of the water and that's because of the high uh, food content. Um, things to watch out for when you're always worried about this um, and triggers you think of, I always think of you know, someone who's younger than age 50 with no previous colon cancer, or we screening those people, uh, family history of colon cancer, uh, weight loss, rectal bleeding, uh, recent change in bowel habits. If this, had, they, this was a sudden change, people would have abdominal pain all their life for various reasons, but those are things to pay attention to. Um, iron deficiency anemia in a person over age 50, uh, for, uh, for a, a family doctor, that means they have cancer until proven otherwise. And then heme positive, if you do stool for occult blood, those are again, looking for, for, for a bowel cancer or, or pancreatic cancer. So this is the slide that uh, uh, sort of uh, talks a little bit about malabsorption and steatorrhea. And this is patients who had chronic pancreatitis. So that's what the CP stands for. And if you look at people who have mild chronic pancreatitis, only about 10% of them has steatorrhea. But if you actually measure if they have malabsorption and their vitamin levels and, and different levels of, of nutrition are adequate, 70% of them have malabsorption, but only 10% have steatorrhea. And even when it's severe, when you're seeing about 30% of patients having a steatorrhea, 80% have malabsorption. So there's a, quite a disconnect between the, the, that final symptom of steatorrhea and that whether they're truly malabsorbed. If the patients had chronic, you know, um, chronic pancreatitis for greater than 10 years, almost all of them, it's 94% in this study that showed they had malabsorption. As I said, this can occur with many, many diseases and many people could have symptoms of this and have no history or no problems that they don't have PEI. So you have to always think about this and, and try to figure out why, whether those symptoms you're having, you know, we, I remember in medical school, uh, every, every time we learned a new disease, we diagnosed ourselves with it. It happens all the time. So you have to think, you have to think that how to rule it in to rule it out. So very common, a lot of people have irritable bowel syndrome and they have diarrhea with it. They have abdominal pain, they eat, they have a lot of bloating, they have a lot of diarrhea. But the big thing between that is most patients who just have irritable bowel, they don't usually lose weight. And it's a lifelong history. It's a history of this that occurred early on, starting in the late teens to early 20s, and they've had it all their life. And so it can fluctuate, get better or worse, but all the same symptoms, don't have the weight loss and have that long family history. Uh, patients could have bile acid malabsorption. Those same symptoms, the abdominal pain, the bloating, the diarrhea, but the differentiating feature of this is, is the fecal urgency and incontinence. You don't get that with, with uh, pancreatic insufficiency. Celiac disease, again, a very common thing we see, often not uh, picked up a lot of bloating, diarrhea, they will get some steatorrhea, they will have weight loss. Sometimes they get uh, um, uh, certain uh, uh, rashes, but it's less than 10% of people. But the big thing with that is you put them on a gluten-free diet. So sometimes it's a matter of trying different things, seeing, well, this helped. Oh, well, you know, I'll try the gluten-free diet and see if that made a difference. And there's people who have histories having problems all their life until someone said, try this gluten-free diet, and it made a difference. 
Crohn's disease, again, a very common disease along with the ulcerative colitis can have a, a, abdominal pain is the, is, the, is the main symptom you have with those patients. Uh, Crohn's a lot more diarrhea and weight loss. Again, it can be very similar to a PEI, but these patients with Crohn's typically will have a lot more fever. They'll have iliac colitis. They may have abscesses and, and fistulas. Ulcerative colitis, they'll have more bloody diarrhea. So if there's blood in the stool, uh, you're thinking that it's probably not insufficiency. It's something else going on. Um, fecal urgency and tenismus. Tenismus is a feeling of, of incomplete evacuation when you have a bowel movement. And then people can have microscopic colitis, another one of the colitis is abdominal pain, weight loss, but they usually have more watery diarrhea as opposed to the steatorrhea, the, the foul smelling greasy stools. So all these things are, are, are diseases and there's a number of other ones. And sometimes you can't tell and you have to do, think about who you're looking at. So you think of those high prevalence populations. Is there a group of people that might be more likely to have that. And so this is the slide I talked about a little bit earlier with the question. Now, if you take patients with cystic fibrosis, and this is a, um, a, a survey of a, a number of different populations, cystic fibrosis, anywhere from 55 to 100% of them had uh, pancreatic insufficiency. And uh, I, I, I would think if they've had cystic fibrosis for a while, it would be more on the 100% than the 55%. Again, people who have a pancreatic dual denectomy or Whipple's uh, operation where they've had their pancreas removed, it's anywhere from 40 to 100%. And again, most patients with that would be on the higher side than that. Uh, this, this survey found that people with chronic pancreatitis, 80 to 90%, you saw the earlier slide had in a little different category, but depends on how long they've had chronic pancreatitis for. Patients with HIV can have uh, pancreatic insufficiency. And uh, that's about a, a quarter to half of them. People with type one diabetes. And, and, and as I mentioned earlier, celiac disease can have this. What do you do? Well, if you think this could be it, they're in someone, a patient who's had a Whipple's operation. They might have, uh, you know, uh, may have uh, had uh, cystic fibrosis, or you think this could be the diagnosis, then what do we do? Well, we usually start with a therapeutic trial. And what do I mean by therapeutic trial? Well, you try pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. So you uh, try, and what I usually do is, um, and there's several different ones, whether it's Creon, uh, Codazyme, or um, um, several different brands of this, but you try enough that will initially work. Now, the thing you have to be aware of is you have to try this for at least a little while. So the often patients in the first week that they start on the enzymes, they may get worse initially. So as it breaks down, those, those enzymes start working. There's a lot of food that's been left behind that has to be worked on. And so those enzymes actually will make things a little bit, you'll start digesting all that food that's been sitting in the gut for a while and, and that has to come out. And so that could be up to a week that you'll see patients will be worse. What I usually do is you may start with, uh, if you're using the, for example, Creon 25, you may use three tablets with a meal, two with a smaller snack. If you're just having a, a muffin, you might take one. So around eight to, to 12, tablets a day. You have to judge it. You have to let the patient sort of say, well, I'll take this mount or that mount and see what happens. And if you symptomatically got better, well, that supports the diagnosis. Does it make it absolute? No, but it really is. Most physicians would say if, if we took it and it got better, that's the diagnosis. Um, you can actually measure this. You can actually do a 24-hour stool collection and you measure the fat content and see how that changed. And in clinical trials, they do that. I cannot recall a patient in 20 years that I have had to do that. It's usually a clinical diagnosis. We try the enzymes. If it works, it works. 
And, and, and as we've learned more about pancreatic cancer, we've recognized this as being a much more common problem. And, and I would say that you're seeing people do this a lot more often than they did in the past. So what do we look at? We look at the clinical symptoms. We look at the differential diagnosis. Could this be something else? Could, they, could this be celiac? Could it be something that, you know, could they have Crohn's disease? Did they have bloody diarrhea? Were there other symptoms with that? Were they in a high prevalence population? Did they seem to have markers of malnutrition? Did they have, you know, the fingernails that weren't quite uh, formed as well? Were there, were there uh, weight loss? And then you try a therapeutic trial. What else can you do? Well, watch what they, they're eating now. Um, uh, see, you know, and, and, and this is very common for, for pancreatic cancer um, or any cancer. Uh, we do a lot better when we have frequent low volume meals. So just trying going with, you know, five, you know, often people with cancer don't have a good appetite, food doesn't taste right. Um, they often quickly get turned off by eating certain foods. And so if you say, don't, don't have a big turkey dinner in front of you, think of you know, multiple small, frequent, low volume meals. Um, avoid foods that are, are difficult to digest. Uh, don't fill up on salary. You, know, there, you, can, you, you can waste a lot of energy eating salary and, it, and, and, and uh, it's difficult to digest. Um, and, and we don't, you know, we, all of us, uh, uh, when we're healthy, we're trying to watch our weight. We try to restrict how much fat we have, which is a high calorie uh, food. And when you are um, with cancer, you have pancreatic insufficiency or you have uh, malabsorption, you don't want to restrict the fat. Now the fat, if you don't take the enzymes, is going to go through you, but um, hopefully it won't as the, as the uh, enzymes kick in and start working. And then Dr. Think Caldwell, about, can I interrupt again with a couple sure. of questions? Sorry. Yeah. Um, they're more related to the previous topic. Um, but from Gary, he would appreciate it if you could explain um, the differing colors of stool with ongoing pancreatic cancer. The different, sorry, of what? Like the different stool colors to watch for. Okay. So when you, when you have a bowel movement, the... Most bowel movements look, look brown. If you don't have, if your jaundice or your liver is not producing enough uh, bilirubin, then your stool will typically look paler and whiter. So the, the brown color comes from something called bilirubin. They, they, when someone is jaundiced, that's what the same thing that's coming out that makes your stool look brown comes out in the skin is yellow. So that's this. So when you aren't absorbing food or when your, your, your color that goes in there, different colors than if you have blood in the, in the stool, it will look red. If it's blood from high up in the gut, it often looks very dark, like black or tarry colored. And pancreatic insufficiency it's getting through you a little bit quicker. You might have a little bit less, depending on the cause of it. You may have less bilirubin, so it may look paler, but it'll also break apart a lot more, look a lot greasier, and it'll look and 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 uh, and, and and float a lot more in the in the, in the in the toilet bowl. Okay, thank you for that. And then we have. Nathan um, asking if there's any downside to trying hurt if you're not sure that the patient has um, exocrine insufficiency and what would be the side effects? Yeah. So generally not other than, you know, they, they are none of these are cheap. None of them are really, you know, uh, pennies uh, for a, a pill, but if you suspect it, you aren't going to cause them. It's pr pretty unusual to cause harm by taking pancreatic enzymes. And so uh, it, it's it, it's it's a it's a fairly easy uh, decision for a doctor to say, let's at least try it. 
Okay, thanks so much for that. May I ask a question? Sure, Joan. It, um, if a gallbladder is removed, you're not going to have the, the uh, bile or the bilirubin. How does that affect uh, the pancreas? So, so if the gallbladder is removed, you still have your bile duct. So your, okay. your gallbladder is basically a storage facility. So when you eat, it contracts and puts out some bile that helps break down your food. Um, but if you don't have the gallbladder, if you had a gallbladder removed, you still make bile. It just doesn't come as well. And sometimes you don't, don't have um, as much breakdown of the food because you don't have that bile that's helping those pancreatic enzymes. So you won't have the big surge of bile coming together. Interesting people who've had their gallbladder out, um, they will typically always be producing some bile, but rather than it being stored in the gallbladder, it often trickles into the bowel. And so some people can have develop almost irritable bowel type symptoms just because they constantly have that bile draining in there. Mm -hmm. And in big, huge studies, there is a little bit higher incidence of bowel cancer in people who've had a gallbladder removed because it's a constant irritation of the bowel. And so it's, it's one of the minor uh, causes of, of, of bowel cancer, but people who have epidemiologically, who've had their gallbladder out, they have a very slightly increased incidence of bowel cancer as well. Thank you very much. What else can we do? Well, uh, smoking, uh, you know, I don't know anyone out there that doesn't know that smoking is not good for you, first off, but it is a risk factor not only for, uh, you know, for, for not only for lung cancer, but a number of other cancers, including pancreatic cancer and acute, including acute pancreatitis. Um, it's associated with increased probability of developing PEI. And um, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, shown to have an earlier development of pancreatic calcification. So smoking, uh, not only we think of it in terms of lungs and things like that, it can have other effects. Um, alcohol restriction, uh, people, the, the, um, uh, one of the most common causes in North America for pancreatitis is, is, is alcohol. And, and if patients who typically come into emergency as an as a internist, when you're seeing someone with pancreatitis, uh, our first thought is, could this be alcohol? So it does inhibit gastrin lipase secretion. It accelerates deterioration of pancreatic function. And uh, there is some suggestion uh, uh, in, in some patients with chronic pancreatitis uh, that may be reversible if they stop taking, taking alcohol. So what about replacement? What do we do for replacement? And here are some of the, so what the pancreatic enzymes, uh, they contain pancreatin or pancreatic lipase. And this is important. This is extracted from, from, from pig pancreatic glands. It contains the enzymes, lipase, which breaks down fat, amylase and protease, breaking down you know, uh, carbohydrates and, and proteins. But in that it has, um, has is, comes from pork. So some, some people who have, uh, uh, because of, uh, you know, are Muslim or Jewish who may not eat pork products, you cannot, you may not, may have a religious um, reason not to take this medication. There, I know in, in a number of um, uh, religions, that they've actually been able to get a uh, exemption from this. And they've actually said they can take this because they need it for medical reasons, but it may be worthwhile to talk to your rabbi or, or, or a man or, or a priest about this. If you, if you're thinking about that, if you're thinking about pancreatic uh, enzymes, there's two types. There's the non coding coded and the enteric coded. The advantage of the enteric coded is that, um, it, it's the, these um, uh, medications, if they're not coated, they may break down in the gut 
and you have to watch that. And so you may be taking the pills, the pills, they aren't getting to where they need to work because they're broken down. So uh, uh, most of the people, most I've always used now enteric coated ones and uh, uh, the coating rapidly dissolves at a certain pH and that's the pH once you get to the duodenum. So it doesn't become active until you get to the duodenum. Um, if, it's, if it's still acidic like it is in the stomach, that uh, those beads will not do anything and the coating will stay and protect it. And then it comes in capsules. And, the, and I know the Creon one, um, the capsules you can open up and you can sprinkle the, the, the little granules that are inside that capsule so that if people have problems swallowing foods, they can open it up, put it on ice cream or, or whatever they're eating and, uh, and uh, take it that way. Um, just this is just an example of uh, some of the the ones and and the, this is Canadian. There are um, some of these uh, drugs have different names depending whether it's in Canada or the United States. Um, sometimes there are multiple more uh, generic versions of this. Uh, the ones you'll hear is Creon, um, uh, Codazyme, and 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 Codazyme. One of the the one of the most of them. I just use the the um, enteric coated ones, there are non enteric coated ones. Codazine. One downside is that um, they actually haven't done any studies on patients. So I don't think that there is that's a downside. I, I don't think there's any reason to think it wouldn't work in pancreatic people or, or in geriatric people. Um, pancreas is another one, uh, Viacin. So there's there's a number of different medications, and I would recommend these first three, but there are multiple other ones that may be available, and some of these have gone generic as well. They've been around for quite a time. And you'll see that they have a different strength. So the Creon comes in fives, tens, 25, and that usually refers to the lipase. So it's 5,000 units of lipase, the problem is you can't interchange. So you may be saying, I've been using the 10 of Creon. I use three of those pills with a big meal. It works fine. But for the co-design, you might need 25 because it's it, the way they measure is not exact. And so you, whenever you switch from one brand to another, you're going to have to almost play it a little bit by ear. And even depends on how much you eat. If you eat a, a much more... Uh, uh, greasy uh, meal, it might be that you'll need extra ones that you'll, you know, you'll find that and you have to play it uh, how, how, depending on what you're eating, play a little bit by ear. We're getting uh, a lot of questions about this section. Okay. Yeah. I'm interrupting. <laughs> okay. Um, from Keith, he's saying that um, his brother was stage four cancer, um, is HIV positive in BC. And you say these enzymes are expensive, but do you know which provinces they're covered by provincial plans? There, there are some provincial plans cover them. More of the Western provinces cover them than the Eastern provinces. I know Nova Scotia, it's, it's partially covered. Um, I don't know, and you have to go locally. And, you have to, and so most cancer centers have... Um, have now have, at least in Canada, have these things called DANs, which are drug access navigators. Drug access navigators are, 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 are uh, people whose job is to help find out how to get these different drugs for the patients. And uh, whether that's even sometimes drugs that have come out compassionately or not yet on the market or, uh, or that they have one drug plan and they'll say, well, you need this drug plan or this drug plan. So it, 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 the, the drug access navigators are immensely uh, um, uh, critical for us uh, working in a cancer center. So we couldn't do our job without them. They, they, they find out all these things about, oh, this is covered, this isn't covered. Is the drug access navigators, Dr. Caldwell, are those um, individuals that the physicians reach out to or that the patients and caregivers can reach out to? So it again, depends on where you are. We reach out to them. 
our, the nurses that work with us can, can, can reach out them, to them directly. Um, it's usually through the cancer center that, that uh, uh, and it's usually anyone in the cancer center that can do it, at least in our center. Um, I think that's the same in most cancer centers across Canada, but I'm not positive about that. Um, if you've had contact with them before, often they're very open to coming back to them, but it's hard to get hold of them the first time. So I'd usually go through one of the healthcare professionals. Heidi was asking how oh. fast do you expect results once you start treating exocrine insufficiency? Okay, so um, usually you get, usually if you've had them on for a week, and like I say, the first week you make it a little bit worse, first couple of days and then it gets better. And I usually give them at least two weeks uh, to know if it's working. And I have a couple slides a little later on talking about that, if it doesn't work, what to do. But usually it's about two weeks we try before we do something. George was asking, what is the best timing for taking Creon? I have received three different instructions, take it 15 minutes before, take it with the meal, take it 15 minutes after starting to eat. <laughs> so one of the problems is you take it you usually take it, you know, if you're doing Creon, that's enteric-coated, so that goes through the stomach. It's not activated until it gets into the duodenum. So if it, until it gets through the stomach and the pH and the uh, bicarb from this release from the pancreas has brought the, the, the acid level up, that won't be activated. So actually for Creon, which is enteric-coated, it, 15 minutes before, during the meal, it shouldn't make a big difference either one of those. So you just want to take it and you want to take enough depending on what you're eating. Now everyone's different. And that's the problem is we may have, if you've had a Whipple's operation, it's not going through the duodenum, it's going a different way. And so, and if you have, I don't know if everyone's heard of dumping syndrome, when you've had the stomach, you know, operation of the stomach, sometimes the food goes through the stomach too fast. So you almost have to play a little bit by ear when you're going to take that, because if you're having food that goes through your stomach very quickly, you may want to, you know, if you take it after the meal, it may be too late. So you may want to take that with the meal or just 15 minutes before the meal. So it gets to the right place before that food gets there. Uh, I'm just going to jump in and make one uh, a suggestion uh, for patients and caregivers as well, because it, it seems like it's not, it's certainly not a, you know, one size fit all treatment plan. And, yeah. you know, Dr. Caldwell, do you think it would be good for um, patients and caregivers to maintain a food journal and say, today I ate this, this meal, and these are the enzymes I took, this is the amount I took, and then have a column for the result of it. And then at, at least for me, it would be hard to remember every meal and what foods um, took what amount of enzymes. But if you kept track of it and saw success, then you know you could go back to that meal with that successful amount of enzymes. Uh, absolutely, that you're you're stealing some of the future slides. Oh, okay. But. I'll, I won't <laughs> <say anything. laughs> but, but but that's true. It's it's you need a food journal to know, and it is it's not an exact science. So you have to say, and 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 you know I don't eat the same meal every single night, and we all you know usually have some variety in our food, and you're going to have to figure out that. Oh, when I have those fish and chips, uh, they're really good, but they, I pay for it because I'm not absorbing that fat in the, in the fish and chips, and I'm going to need to take some extra enzymes at that time. So just this is just a, another slide talking about some of the, some of the uh, uh, places that you might use it for. And, and obviously in this population, pancreatic cancer is what we're talking about the most or someone who had pan pancreatic surgery. But even if you've had bypass surgery, like a Bill Roth gastroesthenoid, where you do for, you might do that for, for weight loss, those people, because the anatomy's changed, they may develop pancreatic insufficiency because that those enzymes aren't getting to the food at the right time. And the contraindication, obviously, remember if you have hypersensitivity to, to, a, to a porcine or a pig protein, or to pancreatic enzymes. This is a, is a, 
uh, a, a randomized controlled trial, so you know, level what we would consider in, in medicine, level out one evidence, where what they basically did had patients 18 years older who had pancreatic surgery, they had put them on PERT before they had surgery, and then had, had a run-in period, and then when they had surgery, they randomly assigned them to pancreatin, which is one of the pancreatic PERTs, uh, versus placebo, and, and looked not only at how they felt and clinical outcomes, but also did 72-hour stool collections and actually measured the, 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 the stools. And these patients, as you know, I was talking about not exact, these patients had anywhere from nine to 15 tablets. That should be tablets, not tables per day, or to tables. Um, at three with each meal, two with each snack. And this is the results. The patients that had the pancreatic enzyme, and there was only the small numbers, 31 patients, but this CFA or coefficient of fat absorption was certainly a lot improved when they did it, but it did not seem to help when they were on placebo. And the difference between whether they're taking this, whether you're reading, you know, measuring fat absorption or you're measuring the coefficient of nitrogen absorption, which is another method of, of measuring nutrition, or even just the plain stool fat. The stool fat went down substantially uh, when you're on the pancreatic enzymes and went up when you're on the placebo. So all those are statistics significant. So we know that this works. You know, we know it works clinically, but it's nice to have the clinical trial that's actually measured absorptions. And, and the big thing, it was a very well tolerated, uh, even when you looked at every single Averse event, and many, many of those patients, the averse event wasn't related to the uh, to the enzyme. But when you measure that overall, uh, there's only about there's 25 percent, 26 percent of the patients who had uh, had uh, placebo had some side effect, and there's only 37 percent or another about 10, 11 percent had uh, had uh, uh, some type of side effect. Now, as you see, some of the more common ones, it could be just flatulence, which they're having beforehand, abdominal pain, diarrhea, uh, nothing really came up. There's a couple that had uh, had some fever when they first started on that. Though. What are, you know, someone asked, what, is there any downside to taking this? On the whole, most people don't have any problems, but there's a this, um, Things seen with cystic fibrosis patients where they're getting these, this fibrosis and colonoscopy and they almost have strictures all throughout their bowel. Um, and they've seen that whether that's related to taking the pancreatic enzymes or not, we don't know, but we've seen that in patients. Um, as I mentioned, you have to be careful when you go from one part to another, there's not a, a direct substitution. So it could be a, a very different doses. Um, extremely high doses. There's this thing called hyperuricemia, um, which is what you see where it can have gout-like symptoms with it and it can have problems with the kidneys. Um, that's if you take very high uh, amounts. Th these enzymes come from animals. And so there's a theoretical risk. Could there be because it's a you know, the same as when we used to get, we, when we didn't make synthetic insulin, when we got insulin from pork or beef, there's a theoretical risk of, of viral transmission. There could be some virus that we don't know anything about. Um, and, and as with everything, any drugs, you have to be cautious if you're pregnant. This were, were mild um, uh, GI, abdominal pain, diarrhea, flatulence, that sort of stuff. Like I said, the extreme high doses, this hyperuricemia or semia, where they get high uric acid in your blood and your urine, um, and then watch for allergic reactions. Uh, abdominal pain was less than 10%. This is sort of a, a dosing recommendation for most, uh, you know, cystic fibrosis, they often need a lot, but uh, for other conditions, which is what we'd be looking at most, and you'll see the range, 25 to 80,000 uh, lipase units um, a day. And, and that varies quite a bit. And you just have to play a little bit by ear. 
And then this is where I was going to say, and have a, have a food journal and keep track of what you're eating each day and how many enzymes you took and say, oh, oh yeah, when I did this, I need more, I need it less or whatever. And so, you know, like a, a snack, they say maybe take a half dose for a snack, depending on what the, 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 the food is. Uh, and again, the timing, like I say, take during or after meals. Uh, you want to take with a fair bit of fluid. Um, you want to make sure that the capsules ideally should be swallowed intact, but it can be open if you are, are having problems swallowing. Uh, you want to, you can open it up, uh, but you want to put in something acidic. You don't want to put in something basic. So something um, like an apple, orange juice, something like that that's acidic, because if you put it in something that's in food that's very basic, um, not basic in, in, in terms of the pH, then what can happen is the coated, the enzymes can break down or the coating on the enzymes breaks down and it starts working at the wrong place. So you want to be sure if you do take it with food, you want to take it in food that is a little bit more acidic and soft. Someone said, well, how do we give it a trial? So one thing that we've seen, you know, is, is, is uh, uh, Dr. Koop was famous for saying, drugs don't work in patients so they don't take it. So if the person is saying, oh, this isn't working, make sure they're taking it. Are they taking it at the right time? Are they, are they crushing it up? Are they doing something differently? Or, you know, I've had many patients, you know, I've had my mom say to me, I'm having a lot of back pain. I said, are you taking your pain medications? No. Well, I can't help your back pain if you aren't taking the pain medications. So take your medications, make sure they're being done properly and watch how much you need. Um, the, as I said, sometimes if you're become, one of the problems is that the, the, the uh, enzymes are being activated at the wrong time. And so one of the things that we've seen is sometimes the duodena becomes too acidic. And then when the food bolus gets into the, out into the duodenum around that area, those lipases have been inactivated and they won't work uh, because it's too acidic. Um, that can be from uh, sometimes bile salt precipitation and, and it, uh, the uh, enteric uh, coated granules disintegrate so one of the answers to that is add a PPI or a protein pump inhibitor. And that's drugs such as LOSAC, Prolosac, um, uh, 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 all these, uh, there's about six different ones on the market. And, um, and, and that may be very helpful. So which patients do we try it on? Uh, if uh, this, is, this is a study where they use uh, uh, as a meprazol and you found that the patients, uh, when they took both, they did a lot better. I think I had another slide, oh, here it is. So when you looked at people at the basal level, measuring a, a measure of how much acid they're getting was down low. When they took PERT, it improved, so they're absorbing more food. When they added the, the uh, uh, PPI or the protein pump inhibitor, they did a little bit better but that's looking at all the groups. So if you actually break this down to the patients that they didn't clinically respond, what happened, if you look at this, you can see that these are the non-responders and they didn't really get much of malabsorption, but when you gave them the PPI, they came up quite a bit. So if after a week or so, the patient says, these pills aren't working for me, then it might be worthwhile to add this second drug on top of it. The other interesting thing about pancreatic insufficiency is there's patient, there's been people looked at, um, people with pancreatic cancer. This, was, this study was a retrospective review. All patients um, were palliative and one half the group were given PERT and other, other half the group was given no PERT. Um, and they watched them over time. And uh, 
when they looked at this, they, they looked at what factors seem to be. People that got chemotherapy has statistically significant improvement in survival. But if you look down here, I'm trying to find it on the slide here. Um, they're all the same for gender, for tumor size. Um, I think it's on the next slide here. Yeah, you look at this, patients who receive PERT had a higher survival. So it made a difference in how long people lived, whether it was, it was as, you know, not quite as much as chemotherapy, but significant enough that if this was a trial that we are calling this chemotherapy, we'd be prescribing this for all patients with pancreatic cancer. So PERT has a survival advantage as much as some of the early pancreas cancer trials showed. And so that may be because the person's absorbing, they're more not as malnourished and they live longer. But it's important for your doctors to know that, and important for them to consider this when you're looking at patients. And this was another trial, uh, population study that looked at that and uh, they matched people that were getting PERT and not getting PERT and consistently in all groups, the patients that got PERT had a survival advantage. So to us, uh, you know, as, as oncologists, you know, we've always said, oh, we want to keep our patients well. We want to keep them, you know, so they're, they're malabsorbing. And we have used these, these enzymes for that reason. But this is a, is, is shows us it's not just that, but taking these med medications for people who have, you know, insufficiency, they're going to make a difference and it will make the patients live longer. So one of my conclusions, um, if you don't have exocrine function, if it was insufficient in the pancreas, you're going to have problems. The patient's not going to feel well. They're going to have abdominal pain. They're going to have loose stools, going to have some weight loss, going to have steatorrhea. It's very common in patients who've had pancreatic cancer or pancreatic surgery, in the HIV patients and type 1 diabetes and celiac. Um, you have to look at their clinical symptoms, what symptoms they're having. Could this be something else? Could this be Crohn's disease? Could this be a celiac? Are they, do they have markers of malnutrition? Is it a high prevalence group? And then give them a trial of PERT to see if they, if they fit all that, give a trial of PERT. Um, in terms of nutritional, you want to go to frequent low volume meals. You want to have a, um, uh, um, a calendar watching what they're eating when they're on those, those enzymes so you can tell whether it's working for this meal or that meal and find out how much works. Um, important to know that these are, are uh, pork uh, products. And so you have to be aware that they are from an from animal and there may be people that can't take it because of that. Um, they are available as a non-coded and enteric-coded. And I always use the enteric-coded because that, you know, it will work there, but you have to be worried with the enteric code at once. You want to make sure that they uh, that uh, it, it, the pH, if you're giving it with food, the pH of the food is the right way. Um, if for cystic fibrosis, we base it on body weight, for, but for most adults and most of us, it's it's you know a huge difference from one person to another, and you just sort of start with one dose. And, and increase their titrated by meals. Um, and if they aren't getting better with this and they're still having the symptoms, you still think it is, it's worthwhile to add a PPI or a proton pump inhibitor like Losec or, or a Prolosec or one of those. And that's the end of the talk. There's a whole bunch of references if people want to uh, open up to questions. We have a few questions that we could start with from the chat. Uh, from Patricia, she was asking if there are any over-the-counter enzymes that you would recommend. So I, I would say if you're going to try it, you want to have ones, and I would use the prescription ones. I don't know if the over-the-counter ones, uh, and you'll hear all kinds of things tell you at the natural food stores that they have these things that may be good, but when it's a 
when it's a natural product and it's sold in a natural food store, there is not the there's not the rigor in proving that they're fine. And, and there is a I know there was a marketplace um, study they did years ago looking at fever few. And we know the active ingredient fever few uh, is helps with people with uh, a fever. When they looked at this, there's people who there's some uh, drug, you know, drugs, natural drugs that had fever few. Some of them work very well. Some of them, the active ingredient, which we actually could measure, wasn't even in that drug. It was on the counter. There was one that was extract of fever few, and they extracted all the fever few out of it. The company after marketplace was on realized this and pulled it off the market. But if they hadn't done that study, because normally a lot of the over the counter ones measures when it's a drug, they have to prove that it's active. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump in there for a second, Jessica, before you ask. I know a lot of. Um, access to enzymes often comes down to cost. And um, I would suggest that if you're struggling financially, um, I know Kate mentioned if you're in Canada, you can access patient financial support grants through us. But if you go to the World Pancreatic Cancer Coalition website, um, all of the uh, charities from around the world are listed there. And on that list, you'll see which organizations in which countries offer financial support grants to patients, um, you know, specifically to help them access treatment. Um, so if you just go to the World Pancreatic Cancer Coalition website and you look for financial support, um, you'll see those organizations in your country um, where you can go and apply for financial, for, for financial support for treatment specifically for enzymes. One off the top of my head in the United States is um, Project Purple. I know that they offer patient support grants, um, but there's a list of other ones I, I can't name off the top of my head, but it's just a, another resource for all of you. Sorry, Jessica, next question. <laughs> and, and also just to add that, that also the companies that make these will, a lot of them do have compassion of the available drugs that you know, you, the, you, it's like uh, you, know, you don't know about it until you ask. So sometimes you ask the company and they will provide them. Okay, okay thank ahead, you. Um, so Pat was wondering if all fats require the same amount of enzymes to help digest them? Gen generally, yes. So, so the, 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 end, the, the fat is fat and, and is broken down. And so generally all different types of fat will have about the same type of enzyme. You may find in an individual person a little bit difference, but that may be more how they're digesting it than, than the fat itself. Great. And James was wondering if there's any downside to taking a PPI drug. So again, um, we, you know, in medicine, we try to avoid drugs as much as possible. Most people with PPIs, um, I, I see lots of patients and uh, I would say at least a third of them are on a PPI. Um, there's not any long-term studies that we know that there's some major side effects from PPI, um, but as our principle is we try to avoid drugs if we, if we can. So um, it's a relatively safe medication, but we try to avoid it. Okay, that's all we have from the chat. So if there's we other did have questions. some questions that came in prior to which, um, Dr. Cole, I think you saw some, but I'll, I'll read one of them out. Um, it says, in my case, I lost 40 pounds since my Whipple procedure in December of 2018 and find it impossible to gain weight. I am anemic and I am dealing with that situation with iron pills and vitamin B12 shots. I am not a smoker. I have the equivalent of one drink a week. I eat copious amounts of food and try to do the six smaller meals a day. I'm working on reducing my fat intake and having a lengthy no list of high fat foods such as French fries, cheesecake, cream cheese. That sounds like my lunch, etc. I use generous amounts of Imodium to control bowel movements. I, of course, consume enzyme capsules with meals and snacks, 11 or so per day, 40,000 USP units. Despite all this, I average six to seven bowel movements per day, making it difficult to plan and execute schedules, 
driving trips, etc. In short, I have checked all the boxes I know to check. Is this my new normal? Some of it may be. I, has, I, I missed that. Is he on a PPI as well? That might be something that... It doesn't say. Yeah. And so that may be something like this person. It may be worthwhile trying a PPI because it sounds like you're still having significant malabsorption despite the enzymes. It may need more enzymes, you know, but it may be just adding a PPI may make a difference. Okay. Thank you. Um, Bruce, a couple other questions that were um, emailed earlier. So one question was, does Creon cause constipation? And how do you know if you're taking too much? Um, generally, doesn't, if, if you take, uh, well, generally, if anything, um, if you, you know, constipation can be multifactorial. And if you've been taking a whole bunch of Imodium to control your fatty stools, and then suddenly you take Creon and you aren't having the fatty stools, and the fatty stools will go through a lot quicker, you could get constipated you have to back off and other things. So other things can cause it. It won't make, it's probably not directly causing, but indirectly because you don't have as much greasy stools, you can get constipated from that. What was the second part? Uh, uh, how, how do you know if you're taking too much? Sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to tell if you're taking too much. Um, it, like I say, it's, it's more, are you taking enough? And, and sometimes then, because they're costly, you have to sort of then say, well, maybe I'm going to back off, try a little bit less. Uh, another one, and I'm not going to pronounce this right, but is cholestyramine? Cholestyramine. Thank you. <laughs> Beneficial. So cholestyramine is, is, um, can be helpful for certain types, and especially for bile acid-related uh, diarrhea. So cholestyramine will bind to bile acids and can be very helpful. It also, if you have a lot of watery diarrhea, cholestyramine works good for, um, for people who have a lot of watery diarrhea in terms of, it almost works like it binds the stool together and keeps it uh, a little bit more shape and easier to control. Um, in terms of pancreatic in endocrine insufficiency, it, it won't help that, but in terms of other causes and to control the bowel, it can be helpful. What is the impact of being a type 3C diabetic as a result of having the entire pancreas, I guess, removed? So what's the impact of that on so, using digestive enzymes, maybe? So anybody who has had the entire pancreas removed, they will have pancreatic insufficiency. You know, they, they don't have the organ that's... And that's, does, will the diabetes play, you know, a role? Does, do things have to be adapted because of the diabetes or... Independent of the diabetes, whether okay. you're diabetic or not, if if you have, you know, if you have had the pancreas removed, then you need the enzymes. There's another question here. Um, what is the best way to assess if I'm getting enough nutrients before it becomes a problem? So sometimes you can measure certain nutrients, and and I don't know if I took. I think I took out a slide. There are measurements in there. You can measure certain enzymes and certain. Uh, blood things that will tell us if you're developing, you know, some some insufficiencies. George's okay. question about metoclopramide. Metoclopramide is a, is a motility agent, so it basically pushes things through your bowel, and it helps with nausea and may help um, that feeling because sometimes when you've had that operation, your stomach isn't emptying fully, so the metoclopramide often help, can help. I'm, I'm also wondering, um, Dr. Caldwell, if um, when, you know, we're looking at a pancreatic cancer diagnosis, we also know that um, mental health plays a huge part um, in, and uh, I know um, as we were rebranding and rewriting, we did a lot of work with uh, Dr. Barbara Kenner, and depression can also mask a lot of other symptoms, or we can associate some of the symptoms to depression and not the, the physical ailments. But I'm wondering if just the diagnosis, not just, but the diagnosis of a pancreatic cancer diagnosis, and that feeling of not wanting to eat could also be the result of, you know, and you went earlier and saying, these are all could be pot scenarios, but could depression also affect 
a patient feeling of fullness or not feeling like they require food or not wanting to eat? And, and is that also something that patients should look at on top of PEI and, and, uh, and enzymes? So, so as I showed some of those examples, people who have these symptoms, you know, abdominal pain, weight loss, depression, you can get all those symptoms. And so, you know, you have to think about the whole picture, the whole scenario, look at all those things. Uh, um, that's, you know, that's part of trying to figure out what it is. You know, obviously, if you're depressed, you can try trial with enzymes, it's not going to help you. Yeah. So I'm wondering for some of the questions when they feel, when patients or caregivers feel, you know, and they've given, they've spent some time experimenting with enzymes. Um, if that need of not wanting to eat or always feeling full or those other symptoms you just mentioned, it's also maybe a good idea to go back to the doctor and, and look at that angle as well. It's always good to go back and double check and see and try to find out what those are and try, you know, there, you know, a lot of times it's, it is a bit of uh, um, educated guessing to try and figure out what's going on, try and figure out what those symptoms that the patient's telling you is and what is the major cause. And in medicine, a lot of times we're taught make one diagnosis, not two, but that's not always true. There's, there's many times someone has, what we call multifactorial causes. They had to have the pancreatic enzyme insufficiency, but they've also are getting that constant bile salt and they're, that's causing it and they're depressed. And so there's many reasons they can have it. And if you treat only one and you know, chalk it up to just that one, you're going to miss some other things. So always say, you know, we, you know, we try to make the person feel as good as we can. Sometimes we have add and try other things on top of that. Can pancreatic enzymes also be administered before starting neoadjuvant chemotherapy treatment? Uh, yeah, because often when you're, when you're getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy, um, you have something in your pancreas that could be blocking or could be causing some pancreatic insufficiency. So it's worthwhile trying even when you're getting neoadjuvant treatment. 